Hello, I'm Jennifer Keller, Programming Coordinator at the Westport Library. Today, we have an exciting book launch of Red Deception, a geopolitical thriller and the second in the Red Hotel series. With me today are its authors, Ed Fuller and Gary Grossman. Who are these men, you ask? Let me tell you. Ed is a hospitality industry leader, educator, and best-selling author, and also president of Laguna Strategic Advisors, a global consortium that provides opportunities and business consulting services. Gary is the author of both Executive Actions and the sequel, Executive Treason, is a print and television journalist, an Emmy award-winning network television producer, film and TV historian. And if that wasn't enough, his career has included producing for major mainstream and cable networks. He is also a partner at Weller Grossman Productions, a documentary and service and information television production company. Whew. So before we get started, I'd like to also remind you that the uh, launch pad for purchasing a copy of this book with a signed book plate We'll stay live through 10 p.m. in case you would like to buy a copy after this event. So, without further ado, welcome Ed and Gary. Well, we're glad to be here. Thank you. Great. Happy to be talking so, to you. <laughs> so, for those of us who maybe haven't read the whole Red Hotel series, could you give us a little background on the series before we get into Red Deception? Well, I think we both can <clears throat> kind of cut into this. Um, the series itself is about a fellow named Dan Riley, who I very humbly indicate to you I was the model for. And uh, as I worked for Marriott for 40 years, but 22 of them overseas as president, it enabled me to get involved in a lot of things. And we have used those. And I needed a partner and a friend like I have in Gary to help me write this. I had written a business book. That was not a problem. But when it came to putting people and characters together, I needed help. And I was not going to use a ghostwriter. And through our BU friendships and connections, I found Gary. And I will just add that uh, Ed um, understated um, the similarity between Dan Riley in the Red Hotel and Red Now Red Deception books, because Ed is the real deal. And those things that he indicated he was involved in were saving lives, were preventing terrorists from attacking buildings and American uh, tourists, uh, getting people out of harm's way. Um, dealing with triads and uh, uh, Mexican cartels, uh, figuring out what needed to be done in order to make our lives safer. And we put all of that in an international story in both uh, Red Hotel and Red Deception, and it'll continue with Red Chaos uh, out for next year, um, wrapped up in a, in a very contemporary, very real world where the characters' names change but some of them are going to be very recognizable, including somebody who is just a, well, a couple of somebodies who have been involved in some major league discussions at NATO and some summits. Um, so it is really jumping out of the headlines, but grounded with Ed's own experience. Ed's the real deal. Wow, okay. So tell us a little bit about this new installment, Red Deception. Of course, don't give us any spoilers because we want people to read the book. Well, the book will be on the final quiz. So of course, everyone is going to have to read the book. Uh, <laughs> they're not short answers, essay questions. So people have to pay attention. Uh, Red Deception picks up right where Red Hotel leaves off. And it deals with uh, a very visible and relatable and recognizable bad guy we call Nikolai Gorshkov. Um, he's the premier of Russia. And like the current premier of Russia, he has had for the last number of decades since 1989, one goal, and that is to restore Russia to its glory, 
uh, and retreat and rebuild the um, uh, the satellite block nations that he had had, and he will go to no ends to make that happen, including um, uh, establishing um, putting terrorists in the United States uh, and around the world to create chaos uh, to keep our eye off the prize, his prizes. And Red Deception picks right up with that story, um, really coming out right out of the headlines. Uh, is Ukraine safe, any more safe than the rest of Crimea? No. What about the Baltic states? Uh, what about the, uh, the oceans? Uh, what is he doing, you know, in terms of cyber attacks and everything else like that? So uh, it's fiction, but not completely. And from the hotel perspective, uh, Dan has the same job I did, the international. And we dealt with a lot of different agencies uh, that have three initials and are involved in a lot of different aspects that we worked with to ensure the safety of our guests and more so our employees also. And it was important that that relationship existed, but things have warmed up in Red Hotel and things are getting a little difficult. And this particular challenge has brought Dan closer to those agencies and needs in the various countries. Um, there is a cultural touch to this because we worked in 73 different countries in Marriott and we are dealing with people that have different cultures and Dan understands some of that relationship and we blended that in. In, re in reality, there were relationships in my job with those same three initials uh, organizations. And so we have taken, I've been out of the company for a while, we have taken those stories and implemented characters who have come from that kind of a background. And we have done some work and Dan keeps getting dragged in, not by choice, but by chance into more than a president of a hotel company. And to that point, when I first met Ed and I met him, it's, it's, it's a wonderful backstory. I met him because we have a mutual friend named Bruce Fierstein. Bruce wrote the first three Pierce Brosnan, James Bond movies. I was mm -hmm. a neighbor of Bruce's. Uh, we'd worked together uh, in a couple of TV shows. Ed knew him from boards at BU. And Ed uh, mentioned to Bruce that he was looking for a collaborator. I bumped into Bruce while walking our dog one day, uh, sleeping back here. And Bruce said he had a, a, a friend he wanted me to meet. A collaborator was interested in, in uh, writing a novel. Well, it took me 30 seconds to realize Ed Fuller was as much in the anti-terrorism business as the hotel business. And those agencies that he talked about that have three letters and, and they're in the news all the time, uh, but what they try to do is stay out of the news as much as possible because they operate around the world. Ed had to deal with those people in order to get information and share information. And I think we're better when we travel because we know that there are people like Ed who were doing that. And I'm blessed as a collaborator with Ed, because every time we sit down, I hear more, I hear more about what happened. And including, Ed, you got, you put people in, in washers and dryers to, to, to hide them? Uh, in Panama, during the Noriega, we'll call it an event, um, the Marriott Hotel, uh, the GM was in the United States for meetings, and our staff was almost all Panamanian. And of course, the country was caught up in an environment which I would call an insurrection. And of course, Noriega's troops were just terrible. 
and they went into different facilities looking to find pro-American uh, organizations and people. They got to the Marriott Hotel and they started looking through the hotel. Our staff had taken the customers and put them into the laundry. Now we're talking large laundry tumblers and dryers and then shut the doors and the troops never found them. They machine gunned every door in the uh, building. I've gone through it and they had done everything they could but they were satisfied that there were no Americans in that building and they left. Eventually we had to get them out and ultimately did and that's another story. Oh, wow. Whew. Well, <clears throat> I'm glad I don't have to be in a washing machine for this interview. <laughs> um, <laughs> so thank you for telling me how you two started writing together because, you know, Westport is a is a writer's town. I mean, it's very artistic. Uh, we have visual artists. We have a lot of writers who live there. Um, and I know that, so now we know how you met, but how do you go about writing a book together with the two of you? Just walk well, us a, through that process. Okay, it's a I'm great question. Defer, I'm gonna defer to the expert. <laughs> We have a great relationship and it starts with that. Um, I, I uh, love getting together with Ed. Um, we have uh, terrific food, great breakfasts, lunches. Uh, uh, have we had a dinner? Yes, we've had dinners yeah. as well. Uh, and a lot of work time in between, all during which Ed tells stories like the one we just heard and others that you will hear today. Um, from those stories, we, we together figure out what's the plot, where do we want to go, where do we start, and where do we end, and who are some of the characters that come in. And from that discussion, we do an outline. Now, the interesting thing about uh, an outline is that it's really the roadmap, the big picture. I'm going to take Route 80 across the state, uh, or 80, what is it, 84 across uh, uh, Connecticut. Or 86, one of the one of those numbers, uh, or the Mass Pike to get from you know Boston to the to New York, uh, upstate New York. It's the roadmap. Once we start writing, all sorts of things happen. We, we want to get off here. We want to get off there. We want to explore this character. Uh, there are knocks at the door. It's like a Twilight Zone episode, where we'll be in the middle of a plot. And I'll call Ed and say, did you hear that knock on the door? And he, you know, what knock? Well, a character just came into the story. I had no idea why or where, but this is a cool character. And then we would talk about the character. We would talk about um, how that character's story and journey will weave into it. And through this comes a first draft, a pretty solid first draft, often long. And then uh, Ed goes through it. We whittle it down, it gets shorter, then it gets a little longer as we add things. So the process is really collaborative from the very, very beginning. And uh, uh, honestly, I couldn't ask for a better creative <clears throat> partner and a friend. Um, I, I just am glad that, you know, I've researched books in the past from the comfort of my computer right here. And Ed, as I said before, is the real deal. He's the guy who's been out there doing these things. So when we're working together, I don't think we've ever gotten upset with each other. Nope. We've disagreed. We've disagreed, but we agree on a common goal, which is the book to entertain our reading guests. And I kind of look at them as guests. I like that. And the point is that we're looking for situations that create opportunities for more excitement. And so we'll be sitting there and I'll say, did I tell you about this? And Gary goes, we, we've got it listed, but no, it's not in here. And I said, well, you know, it may apply to what we want to do to turn this situation around. Now we're, I, me, I'm a junkie for what's going on, history, 
or modern history or politics. And so I'm reading a lot of stuff and we're saying, well, you know, that'll never happen, but maybe there's a chance and we have the right to talk about it in the book and we'll go down that road together. Or we actually dig up one of my stories, like I told you the Panamanian story and try to replicate it. The first incident in the Red Hotel, mm -hmm. which started in, I've forgotten the page number, but it was right up front. If you look at that, it is really, it's set in Tokyo, but that was the bombing of our hotel in Jakarta. And it was not hard to build that particular story around reality. Mm. So about how much of the books are based on your stories, Ed, and how much is just the brainchild, if you will? Well, I would think you've got 25 to 30% of our stories that are used, outlined, and really worked on. Another couple of percentages are used in what if, and we ask ourselves during the incident, what if. Uh, <laughs> then the characters have really come from Gary, but you've got to remember the first book, the characters were Marriott executives uh, that we used uh, and a real situation getting one of my female lawyers caught up in a uh, real difficult situation at a roadblock in Egypt. And so they had their real names. We looked at each other and we said, we can't do that. And then we, we faked the names out. But I, I would say I've got roughly a little short of half of the book. Gary has the skill to blend and make things happen. And Gary has got a lot of knocks on his door because he does come up with a character or two that I didn't meet before. <laughs> uh, the the other thing to mention is that uh, it's the red in Red Hotel is not about Russia as red, but it's about the um, defensive posture and the anti-terrorism um, approach to safety that Ed developed for the Marriott hotels, a color code with red being the greatest threat. And how do we get uh, the hotels as defensive as possible? Um, well, it goes through a various color code stage like, like the US has and many companies have, but that didn't exist before for uh, Marriott. So Ed developed that. And that is another part of the books that come out. Um, and what the, what the organization and the need for that would be in the boardroom and the awareness. And Ed can tell you that uh, the, higher, the higher the degree of preparation and the higher visibility that a hotel has in terms of its defensive posture, the less likely it is to be a target. And where was it in Mumbai and other places? The terrorists, Ed, walked away because? In the case of Amman, Jordan, in the case of Mumbai, in the case of Athens, the police actually reported to us that our security had really turned the folks back that were going to try to have a terrorist attempt. They immediately, though, <clears throat> chose other hotels, regretfully, and our situation is to keep our clients and associates safe. That's our first priority. And we do share with the other companies information. And that was true of this character, Dan. But Gary is totally correct. We had to develop that because we were working internationally in these various countries that did not have their own as developed as the US system. My concern is I doubt many people in the US know what the code level is at any given time. And we've kind of forgotten about the issues here that could be in our backyard just as fast as they are in others. 
So the book got a little warning element to it too. For, for example, if you don't see an American flag at an American hotel, at a Marriott, it may already be on the red uh, uh, category or bollards out in front of the hotel or bomb sniffing dogs or security that are checking keys as you go to the elevator. They're, those are all steps in what Ed designed. And uh, Ed, what countries might be on red now or where would you be loath to travel? See, I'm already interviewing Ed again for the next book. <laughs> well, no, number one, I want to establish something very clearly. Uh, Alan Orlov was my head of security. In the book, you'll find him in there as Alan again. Uh, but um, when we had to move to red, uh, we had to include dogs as a standard part. And we actually had to build a little hotel outside for our security dogs. And uh, it, I learned a lot about dogs and I took Alan aside and I said, if I see a poodle in our staff, you are a dead man. <laughs> well, here I am at home with a poodle. So, and then I found out that poodles actually are guard dogs and were German by background. And the Germans use them as guard dogs for really barking extremely loud and their heavy level of sensitivity. Leaving mm -hmm. the poodles behind and trying to answer the question, Gary, um, when you think about what we were doing and where we were facing these issues, again, the culture played a huge role in, in that environment and being able to work with the people. The issue is, these red levels cost money, well over a couple hundred thousand dollars to get a hotel up to a red level. And we had to deal with owners and convince them. Now, Gary asked where I would be, would not go today. Simple answer for me, but it's going to sound strange, I think, to you. I would not go to Yemen. And that's about it. I am not hampered from going to the other locations. In my, in my lifetime, 151 countries. So it was, an, I went to do business in these other countries if it could benefit the company and our mission. The fact is that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when you went to a red country, you had to know about it. The board of directors did not let our senior executives go to those countries. But my job was to be there with my people that were working there. And we ended my career with over 80,000 staff and employees um, when trouble occurred. And when you set a hotel to red, the amazing thing is our, po uh, our profits went up. And our guests went up because the people that were doing business in those countries wanted a safe place to stay. And that's why we did this also. And mm -hmm. they would, many companies will send their security people out to evaluate the hotels where they're sending a large number of their own people. Sorry, I didn't mean to go so long. <laughs> that's okay. I do, I do have a, a pr another process question for Gary though. So Gary, you've written both the Red Hotel books and your own thrillers, mm -hmm. right? Which is more difficult, incorporating, writing a story that incorporates Ed's background and expertise or coming up with a whole book just by yourself? Oh, wow. I've never been asked that before. Um, I, I think uh, I've never collaborated. I've collaborated with the people on television shows for years. Uh, I've never collaborated or I had never collaborated with anyone on a novel before. And my first reaction was, well, how can I do that? Um, then I realized many people collaborate on screenplays as I have with, with TV. 
And so once I decided, yes, I can do that, and certainly meeting Ed and realizing, oh, this is, this is not going to be an example of having to invent something out of whole cloth. Um, there's a lot of cloth with a lot of weaving and great texture to, to all the stories that Ed has. So I would say this was a, um, a different challenge, but an easier process. Um, and the process is, is really writing, you know, I, I, I thought when I first started writing um, novels and I had written um, nonfiction books prior to that on TV history, uh, how could I possibly sit down and, and write a novel? Uh, how daunting is that? And I, and I realized um, I couldn't, but I could write five pages a day or three pages a day and you do the math and it begins to add up. It certainly doesn't mean it's gonna be ready to be published, but uh, the volume begins to add up and the more you write and the quicker uh, you, or the more often you stay with it and not taking days off, the quicker it all comes together. Um, that became very, very true with all my first books and even more true working with Ed because we would get to a certain point, I would say, Ed, here are my questions for you today before we meet. And I would throw out a question because it was right at the point where I was. And he said, okay, well, let's talk about that. And here's how we can solve it. What happens then is it's not just going forward, then we have backfilling to do because to set something up here, we need to sprinkle a couple of hints or suggestions of it far earlier. And as a process, um, I really learned how to work with, with an amazing man, uh, an amazing person. And uh, uh, we're just gonna keep going. Now that what we do want is a movie or a TV series out of it as well, I'll be perfectly honest. Oh, well, since you brought it up, who would you like to have play your major characters? I have to go to Ed. Who do you want as Dan? <laughs> you know, people ask me this all the time and I said, Dan is 40 years old in these novels. That's, I've got a little age on him right now. And I, I said, I really, the people I start naming are people that have passed that date, like Pierce Brosnan, like, you know, George Laney. Uh, and so it's going to have to be a relatively young, new, eager person who has polished their career sufficiently that they could play a 40-year-old comfortably. And uh, I just don't have a... I'll let you pick the name, Jennifer. <laughs> okay, In well fact, then you you can have you can have a contest and we'll give a couple books to you for the people to name the, <laughs> the character. Ooh, we I might we might be able to work that into our summer reading pr program yeah. this year. Huh. That's we'll talk a great about idea. that one. Okay, I'm gonna write that down. Yeah. Okay, so he, so if you don't have any actors in mind, do you have a director that you would like to be working on this? Well, to be honest, there there are a lot of great directors, and some of the women directors have really started getting into this genre. And I I have not sat and you asked me a question I wasn't prepared for, but I would go out there and take a look at some of them. Boston University, as well as Gary's uh, University are tightly tied to Hollywood. And uh, so their programs actually have uh, not only offices, but they have classrooms in LA to get them deeply involved in the process, the programs and opportunities. And this is not an ad for BU. I'll let Gary do the ad for Emerson. But Gary also went to Boston University and so I have not really focused on that. Even my heroines are a little past their sell-by date in the movies. <laughs> and so 
Uh, the fact is, Demi Moore would be great, but it's past her time for the character that we built in this particular story. So I'm going to defer from here and let Gary answer the question on who <laughs> he would like to have. The, the interesting thing is, um, it was very diplomatic too, Ed, very. Uh, the interesting thing is there are so many people who are in the genre, whether it's the Jack Ryan movies or TV shows or the Jack Reacher movies and coming up TV shows or uh, people who are doing you know international uh, shows like uh, Norway's uh, Occupied. Uh, there's so many good directors out there, uh, women and men. If it's a TV series, often it's multiple directors. If it's a, a movie, it's one director. Um, we're not there yet, and that's certainly it, where we want to be eventually, uh, and be able to talk to some, you know, direct real talent. Um, but we're, but you know, clearly we're excited, and you know, we t we talk about is it a political thriller? Is it an international thriller? Is it a travel thriller? Is it a geopolitical thriller? Um, you know, and people at the library may may even ask, well, you know, I hope it's not a political thriller because I'm up to here with politics or how is it is a rehashing the cold war is it an international thriller in that regard we cross over in so many areas it's an adventure uh it's a journey uh it's a journey where um uh ed's character dan um is smarter than a lot of other people because he knows what he doesn't know and he knows he needs to work with people who do know or work with people who might be able to find things out that he can't find out. And then if, if they know something important globally, what do they do with it? Do they pass it on? I think one of the failings that we saw from 9-11 was that there were real markers that should have been indications that should have been passed along. I mean, if, if somebody is coming into your uh, uh, flight school uh, and is not interested in learning how to land a plane, only fly a jumbo jet, wouldn't that make you want to tell somebody about that? Um, if information comes in that um, the Capitol is going to be stormed and here's what's on the internet, wouldn't you want to make sure that that kind of information goes forward? Well, Dan is part of a team and he's smart enough because he comes out of Army, as Ed does, He's worked, he works with the State Department and the CIA in, in ways that Ed has. He's smart enough to know that he needs to talk to people. And it's once things are recognized that I think that's really what makes a good thriller. It's the pieces that come together. It's the mystery. We could call it, we could call it an international mystery for that fact. You're just answering all the questions that I have already written and that's great. Um, except now I have to tap dance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it, it sounds like what makes Red Hotel and Red Deception and the upcoming Red Chaos um, different from a lot of other thrillers is this basis not within an agency with three letters, but within a hotel. With, that's what you would say, right? So why do you think that will draw people? I mean, it does give us a whole other avenue of, of thought process. Um, are you finding that people really like that different sort of vein? And, and, well, also, and also, does Dan have like long chapters where he's just running through cities? like in everybody else's thrillers? <laughs> well, let me ask the first part and I'll let Gary go after the second question while you work on the next question. <laughs> so, um, so the reason hotels work, at least in my mind, um, we've filmed a lot of different shows, action shows. I've got a picture of one of our hotels blowing up fake. And, uh, and, you know, there are a lot of situations and we're always a part of that, but we do it <clears throat> as a company 
to be known and get on the screen. And, and there are a lot of examples and some sad stories I can tell you about that as to how they went a little wild. Uh, the fact is people use hotels now. A lot of people use hotels and specifically resorts. People don't look around them to see what's going on, but they feel the excitement of a hotel. And let me tell you, you can walk into a hotel and be standing next to a star or a political individual, but you don't know the story that happens when they go to the room or when they go down to the pool to meet someone or go into the restaurant to talk to a bad guy or a good guy. And we have been as an industry very quiet about talking about the things that happen in hotels that you don't want to embarrass the country about. The real answer is that we do that automatically. There have only been a few tell-all books that were set in hotels. But you would really want to know that a lot of things happen in hotels that you couldn't even believe. And I think that makes it a unique setting for the story to be as a base for the people to relate to comfortably where they may not relate to something in the military term or some other area. Gary, anything you want to add? Sure. sure. Um, it, it, uh, we've seen so many stories about a secret service agent and we've seen spies and MI5 and MI6, uh, people working for Interpol. So to some extent, what world are we going to build a story around? And along comes Ed and we have his story and, and his real experience. Um, now, Dan in a, in a matter of 350, 400 pages um, is not solving a crime as Bosch does in Los Angeles, as Michael Conley's books show but he is traveling around the globe. And one thing does lead to another because there are clues and footprints that are in Tokyo that end up in Brussels in Red Hotel. And in, Los in uh, Red Deception, it begins with, and no spoiler alert here, it begins with the bombing of a bridge in Washington, DC, highly vulnerable, and the Lincoln Tunnel and the uh, Stan Musial, Musial Bridge in St. Louis, all in the very, very beginning of the book. Well, what does that have to do with what happens in Stockholm at the end of the book? It has a lot to do with it because of the, 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 the traveling for clues that dance character uh, does. And along the way, I must say there are women characters uh, that uh, one in particular that begins in Red Hotel, uh, that Dan's character becomes very involved with, and that character resolves in Red Deception. Uh, there's another woman character who, um, if you've seen the movie or watched uh, or read the books uh, for, uh, um, uh, or what was it? Um, uh, I'm just blanking on the name of the, the movie suddenly. Um, uh, but there are Russian women spies uh, who are very much like the American spy, uh, the, the Russian men spies, uh, and like Putin himself, were involved in uh, blackmail, uh, were involved in uh, turning people, in, in getting information on them, compromising people. Um, and we had one editor uh, early on in, in, in a first draft of the book who said, is this possibly real? Could this really happen? And we quoted a uh, KGB uh, general, Oleg, uh, now lives in the United States, Oleg Kalugin. And he was famous for this quote. In America, you ask your men to stand up for their country. In Russia, we ask our women to lie down for hours. It's called sexpionage. And there's that element in both Red Hotel and Red Deception. Mm -hmm. I should have helped you earlier, Gary. The movie, one of the movies you were trying to think of, which is a favorite of mine, is Salt. Salt. I love Salt. A L T. Mm -hmm. 
and and the fact is, when I worked overseas, I was often warned in certain hotels that cameras were in use in rooms and be careful. So there are realities that the facilities are really tracking business people, military, diplomats, or someone that they want to, well, this one group was negotiating for rights for a company. <clears throat> and at the morning meeting to sign, they said, we wanted to change the contract. And the people that were telling me the story said, no. And they handed them a manila envelope that had pictures from uh, the evening activities that they had been given. And they just looked at them and said, we come from this country, this doesn't bother us, and threw them back and they signed the deal. But they had gone, the country, well, the country was Cuba, uh, had gone through the process of taking the pictures and trailing the characters. And the other movie, by the way, was Red Sparrow, came out a few years ago, a series of books as well. Oh. Uh, those people are real, they're real. But now there's a title you guys can't use. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> <laughs> Book oh, seven no. will have to be Red Robin. <laughs> <laughs> we'll discuss. We'll discuss that one some other time. Um, so, just thinking about the myriad of things that have happened in the past year, um, are there any news bits that you think you might use in further plot lines in the Red Hotel series? Ed. Jump right into that one, because um, it's maybe the most well, dangerous country out there. I just can't bring myself to take you into red chaos. But let's, let's think about what we're seeing around us. You've got global warming that is impacting the dynamics of the world and impacting different demands and issues that might come up. I can't believe the report I heard the other day, which is that the Navy and the Pentagon says those things flying around up there that everybody thought was crazy are real, but we don't know whether they're aliens or the Russians or the Chinese. I mean, that in itself has unbelievable concern if in fact they were Russians or Chinese. I'd prefer to have an alien appear right now. <laughs> and so uh, the fact is that there are things happening right now <clears throat> with us trying to be a different country, going back four years to who we were, our focus on people, care, and contribution to the world. And there are things happening with two very, very unique people. One is the chairman for China, and she has declared that he is leader for life. And we know that Vladimir Putin wants to be leader for life. And when you think about that, we haven't had that powerful a dictatorship environment um, in today's world in years and years and years, goes back to World War II. And the last thing that I've spent a lot of time on, <clears throat> and it may appear sometime down the road, is China. I've been there well over a hundred times, worked in the market, and spend a great deal of time with different owners in the market. And there's a very clear message if you understand their history. The Opium Wars changed their view of the Western civilizations. And that has stuck in their craw for centuries. And the fact is that they want to return to their preemptive position 
well before the opium wars and to be the strongest and the most powerful. And if you find that as a, uh, maybe, you'll find that that's discussed at school level. And that's an issue that is real. And when you see the potential of the country, um, anything is possible. You got a good preview there. Yeah, I'm, I'm now trying to think of what other countries the, these books might go to. Um, <laughs> well, there's, you know, uh, as long as um, Russia and Putin remains a player, I think Nikolai Gorshkov will remain in the books. As long as global economics are so tied to oil as they are, um, and uh, other natural resources, uh, as long as there's the ability to get in and hack political systems, whether it's in Ukraine or the United States or France or anywhere else, and other countries are doing that. And as long as we are not doing anything really in retaliation, which was certainly part, I'm sure, of the discussion that went on between Putin and President Biden, um, that um, we'll have things to write about. And I guess the, the, the key thing to remember as writers is that we do start with a blank page and we think the unthinkable. Well, the more you think about the unthinkable, the more you can come up with, maybe it's so far unknowable, but it doesn't mean it isn't happening. And then we start laying out, okay, what would it take to really make this happen? And we come up with a scenario and maybe not so surprisingly, after 9-11, the Pentagon, the CIA, the NSA invited who to Washington? Action screenwriters and directors, uh, thriller writers. It was before I started writing thrillers. Uh, they invited them to say, what are we not doing that we should be doing? What are we not thinking about? And even to this day, thriller writers are sent out on what are called red teams. Go evaluate how easy it would be to do harm to an incoming plane from an airport hotel mm. or from uh, a side road or, or a shopping area. Uh, are there protections and bollards up in place? You go in and you observe from your creative point of view because you will see things that we're just not thinking about. So we do think about the unthinkable, kind of get to what's knowable and plausible and maybe that's why a lot of our writing and, and it's, it's come out from members of the FBI and Homeland Security and an admiral and a couple of generals, they say, red deception is a warning and it's right there in front of us. Hmm. Okay, I just so got scared myself now. I, I was thinking that. So on a slightly lighter note, hopefully, um, what are you two reading these days that maybe the Westport Library patrons would also enjoy reading? The problem with the <clears throat> not professional author, that's me. <laughs> uh, the problem is that I'm reading stuff that I like and it's always been thrillers, uh, Clive Cosser, and clearly any number of some of the traditional writers, even though they are turning over some of their writing to their sons and daughters and friends, uh, they have really been who I've watched, who I've seen, and who I've enjoyed on long flights, which I had a lot of. And, but I'm not necessarily out there finding the new uh, author to follow except for this book, The Red Hotel. That's the <laughs> one that has all the potential going forward for me. Do you, okay, but tell us some of your favorite thriller writers then. Well, cl cluster, uh, sorry, Cluster I is one. Mm -hmm. And I would say that when it came to Red October and some of those thrillers around Jack Ryan, that was, spectacular. 
and had all the depth of detail, but also had the excitement and the kind of naive individual who was uh, the character that was built. Uh, you could take it one, one at a time, but it's probably going to be an established writer. And I would say, uh, well, I'm, I'm going through, um, so Ed doesn't worry, this is after I'm um, through writing for the day and in bed, but I'm going <laughs> through uh, Michael Connolly's Bosch books, which I love. Um, and I love the TV series and the newest edition, the seventh season is coming out soon. Um, I, I, on a, on a also nonfiction or a fiction uh, side, uh, John Land, a uh, great thriller writer, um, also in the International Thriller Writers Association, as is Michael Connolly and a number of others I'll mention. He has a new series of books uh, based on the Murder, She Wrote TV series that are just very quick reads and fun. And he's from Providence, uh, and I think he's from Providence, and a uh, terrific writer. Uh, Kimberly Howe uh, writes thrillers, a woman thriller writer, excellent. Um, nonfiction, Malcolm Nance's books on American contemporary American history. And I think the big takeaway that works into our books, he's former Navy intelligence officer, go-to guy on the uh, cable news channels. Malcolm Nance says, and this certainly works into Red Deception, coincidences take a lot of planning. And if you think about that, that's exactly what makes writing for us fun. And I think writing, whether it's a thriller that we do or going back to an old Sherlock Holmes, you kind of figure out what are the clues and what are the, what are the coincidences and who planned them and what's the scheme. In listening to Gary, it's interesting. So a book was entertaining for me to get away from the business. But the amount of reading you do today, even more so post-internet, uh, uh, the fact is, as a business person, you're reading on and on and on on figures and strategy and that is not necessarily made to be a thriller. In reality, some of them become a thriller, but uh, the fact is business people don't spend enough time uh, reading. And I would say that that is also true of anybody who has a job today and is pushing so hard to find good time to relax around a book. I think books need to come back. I understand there are Kindle people out there and they are wonderful, wonderful customers. Audio books, I've got a few, but the fact is that uh, good reading has to be set aside. And it's only in the last few years that I've had the time to really be fair about giving myself time to read. And I do continually read those Red Hotel series because they just are the right entertainment for me. That's the level. And Jennifer, I'll also add in addition to, well, you know, plugging Red Deception, Ed uh, has a book out called You Can't Lead With Your Feet on the Desk. It's a business book. Uh, and it's published around the globe. Uh, a lot of our stories in Red Hotel are, come from his real life stories that are in, you can't lead with your feet on the desk. And the message is, if you're an executive, if you're working in a business, you, you gotta be out in the field. You've gotta be out talking with people. You've gotta be out collecting information. You have to be out observing. You have to be able to say, that's not good enough, or that's not safe enough. Um, that comes from Ed's first book, and it's, it's a terrific business book, but oh boy, it is really a primer on, on how to conduct yourself in any job as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And that'll cost you another lunch. <laughs> uh, it, wow. It's a deal, and we'll figure out where later. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so Gary plugged it, thank you. 
but uh, this came out in 2011. And uh, I was very pleased Bill Marriott endorsed it and um, Marriott got behind it. But it was really not a story about Ed at all. It was a story about business steps and what you need to take. And Gary touched on it, but I'd say the one thing I'd like to stress, it talked about relationship marketing, relationship existing, relationship managing, which we don't necessarily understand when we take it overseas. Mm. Well, I say that your next lunch should be in Westport, Connecticut. <laughs> just saying, I'm just going to plug. You can come visit the Westport Library at the same time. Uh, we do have a cafe, so you can get a cup of coffee along with that lunch. Great. Um, I thank you both so much for telling us about Red Hotel series and Red Deception. Looking forward to Red Chaos next year. Um, thank you so much. Thank and, you, Jennifer. Thank you. And by the way, uh, if anyone wants to check out the website, it's uh, redhotel.com and all the information on all the books are there. And uh, definitely go to the library, uh, support libraries, please, please, please. Brick and mortar absolutely counts. Also local bookstores, community bookstores, uh, but we're also on the, uh, the internet on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and every, every place else. Great, thank you. And thank you all at home for joining us today. You can purchase a copy of Red Deception through 10 p.m. tonight through the link on the registration webpage, or of course, you can borrow a copy from the library. Remember to watch westportlibrary.org for future and recorded events. And thank you both so much. This has been a pleasure finding out more about th these thrillers. Thank you, thanks. Jennifer. Our pleasure. <laughs>